Welcome into Candlestick Chronicles, a 49ers podcast on the Blue Wire Podcast Network. I'm Kyle Madsen. I write about the 49ers over at NinersWire.com, part of the USA Today Sports Media Group. Joining me now, a person who doesn't understand candles, Chris Biederman. <laughs> <laughs> and before we dive into 49ers Eagles, which is what we're talking about in our midweek pod today, and that's what we'll do in our preview pod as well, obviously. Uh, before we do that, let's talk about our friends over at Lamb Shops, sglambshops.com. That's the website. They got new shirt, new hoodie, new sweats, a new Letterman looking bomber jacket with like the leather sleeves. Uh, looks really, really cool with the crossed cleaver logo. I was, I keep, butcher was the only word that was coming to my head. The crossed cleaver logo that is uh, on the back. It's really, really cool. Um, big fan of, of lamb chops. It's the official clothing brand of S of candlestick chronicles. Go to sglambchops.com, follow them on Instagram at sglambchops, and use promo code CANDLESTICK20 for 20% off your order today. It's comfortable, it's quality, and Chris, you look dope. Yeah, I'm feeling dope. I'm wearing, uh, I'm wearing a pair of sweats right now. Great for around the house, great for going out. We love some zippered pockets, um, stylish, comfortable, all of those things. And of course, you look dope, which is the most important thing. Nobody loves a zippered pocket more than you. SGLambchops.com, promo code CANDLESTICK20 to get 20% off today. We're also sponsored by Cooperage Brewing. Shout out to our friends over at Cooperage, cranking out that Candlestick Chronicles Hazy IPA. You can get yours. You can get a case of it at cooperagebrewing.com. You go to cooperagebrewing.com if you're 21 and over and in the state of California, they will ship you a case of beer. It can be Candlestick Chronicles Hazy IPA. It can be McCurdy Cove. It can be Steph Curdy. It can be whatever they, whatever they've got on hand. They will ship it to you if you order a case. You can get a mixed case. That's my recommendation. Get a little bit of everything. It's the single best way to acquire beer, and it's all delicious. Shout out to yeah. You. They, they also have hard seltzers. If that's more of your jam, um, you can get a strawberry watermelon and mint sparkle pants hard seltzer four pack. Obviously. Um, yeah, they have dollar dollar pills, y'all. If you like Pilsners, um, Cooper Clocks, California Common Four Pack, you can get online. They just have, I mean, cold IPA, straight Merck Hazy IPA is delicious. Um, I picked up some Moment of Truth, which is really really good. Uh, when I was there on on Saturday, along with, of course, another four pack of Candlestick Chronicles Hazy IPA. Um, mm. And uh, listen, man. Their, their beer is as good as anything you can get in anywhere in California, anywhere in the country. Um, your favorite, your favorite beer makers, favorite brewery is, uh, is Cooperage. And I feel, feel very comfortable saying that if you, if you know anybody in the, in the Santa Rosa beer scene, uh, you know how much they appreciate Cooperage and, and what it offers relative to, uh, to some of the other bigger names out there, but Cooperage is, uh, is amazing and, uh, and we'll rock with them. Rock with them heavy because uh, because they've been supporting us for a while now. And third year running, Candlestick Chronicles Hazy IPA has been one of their most popular beers since since they've released it three years ago. So shout out to them. Cooperagebrewing.com. Shout out to Cooperage. All right. Let's talk Niners Eagles. Before we talk Niners Eagles, I have a couple things I want to get to. Let's talk Niners Eagles. Before we talk Niners Eagles. One. <laughs> one. How's that guava candle working out for you, you fucking psycho? <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't actually light it. I just uh, I wanted to get a rise out of you before we before we started recording. Kyle has this mania about um, lighting candles that have to be uh, seasonally appropriate. I guess is the best Absolutely. way to say it. And I looked it up. Um, I have a, I have a guava nectar candle that I got mm -hmm. from my time in Hawaii in August. Mm -hmm. Looked it up. Guava is still in season in Hawaii, so you That's don't. Incredible, Chris. Where do you live? You don't really have a point here. Where do you live? When it comes to the seasonal Where candle, live? I live in uh, Northern California, but no, exactly spiritually, exactly. I'm in Hawaii. <laughs> That's a great point. You are. You give off. You give off. I'm in Hawaii vibes. Yeah, for sure. Hawaii. No, yeah. for for me, I'm a big like winter, fall, Christmas guy, and so I believe heavily in in. Uh, having scents that match those things, but that's different for everybody. If you, you know, get to this time of year and you harken back to the days of just scooping up some guava on the, on the, in the sand 
in the end of November, then good for you, man. That's great. I'm happy for you. It's nuts, but I mean, whatever works. It's more of a summer scent for me, but that's fine. It was. Uh, it, it it's a reminder of what the vibes were during during the time in Hawaii, which were immaculate. So anytime you can just reinsert some of those immaculate vibes into your life, you uh, you go for it. <laughs> no doubt. Uh, the other thing is somebody checking in on our YouTube page, uh, the live chat. We are live on YouTube. If you're listening to this on the podcast, make sure to check us out at youtube.com slash at Candlestick Chronicles podcast, or you go to YouTube and just search Candlestick Chronicles, and it'll be right there for you. Subscribe to the page, hit the little notification bell, and you will get notified every time we go live, so you can check out the podcast before it We also out. love, love a click on that like button. We, it's the thing I enjoy more than anything else in this life. It's just a, just a little, little thumbs up. Indeed. Uh, but Ben Wood in our live chat says Niners are the best medicine for this Golden State season. The Warriors stink, dude. <laughs> it's so annoying. Um, it is they currently November. Players. It's it's November 29th. We're doing um, this again. We're doing I this again. I agree with you. Oh, God. I agree with you that they have not looked good and there there doesn't appear to be reason to be to be optimistic. Okay, but that's I would remind you that is November 29th. Okay, and it's 2023. Yeah. Come on. It's okay. They're at the end of their run. It's over. That's okay. My gripe now is that I don't How many times in 2022 were we like, man, this is over and then they won the championship? And not as many because they started it... off really really hot in 2022. That's fair. And that was 2 years ago. Yeah, all I'm saying is, like, you know, that they, they certainly don't look anything close to the best team in the league or anything close to what they were at their peak. Draymond is just emotionally feels like teetering at, at all points. Um, Clay is has been a shell of himself and has been struggling. Andrew Wiggins, I thought, looked pretty good. Um, he was Chris really good Paul's hurt. on Tuesday. Chris Paul's hurt. Um, yeah, I don't know. GP2's I, hurt. GP two's hurt, which is bad. He was he was really like calf. he was making plays all over the floor. It seemed like um, in yep. Sacramento on on Tuesday night. But look, it's championships aren't won in November, Kyle. You know this. Although they, I totally. guess uh, the in season tournaments won in December. A hundred percent. Like the Warriors have checked off the Larry O'Brien box. Mm -hmm. Now they were trying to check off the NBA Cup box, and they they haven't. They failed. Season's yeah. over. I would say no. play the young guys, but that might help them win, which doesn't appear what they're what they appear to be what they want to do. Man, subbing what Moses doing. Moody out of that what three minutes left after hitting five nuts. straight shots, totally nuts. Didn't make any sense to me. Eleven points in the fourth quarter, and Steve Kerr went. Now we got to get Clay's ass back in there, Mister One well, for Five was... and Zero for Three in the second half. Sick. Oh, the, the, the substitution was Wiggins, and given the way Wiggins was playing, I get it, but substitute Wiggins for clay at that point. Yeah, I don't I don't get it. I rock with clay, you know, like clay's clay's a legend. Clay's, clay's a, a legend. Clay's he's got a damn on the wall. You got to do what you can to get him out of like to get him out of whatever funk he's in. But at a certain point, you also got to like try to win the game. Yeah, so. no, I'm and that's if it is a season of, hey, just roll the vets out. Who cares if they win 36 games? We're going to let number 11 and number 30 and number 23 play together and ride this thing out. Then fine. But the cha then championships are not the goal anymore. And that's a bummer, but that's where they're at. So anyways, uh, 49ers, Eagles, 49ers favored by two last I looked. I saw three today. It's up to three. Goodness gracious. So I hit my buddy who's a professional sports better. And I said, what's the deal with this? And he more or less said that the Eagles aren't very good. And his exact <laughs> quote, his exact, no, seriously. He said, he said, Eagles have been dreadful. His exact word. Eagles have been dreadful, but Jalen Hurts has been unreal. And keep in mind, this is somebody who bets on sports professionally. This isn't some random asshole who bets from his day job. On Shout out to all the random assholes out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who among <laughs> us? <laughs> no, he's seriously, he's in like a group of people and they, they make these large wages and stuff. He said, Dallas grossly outplayed Philly. 
the Chiefs on Monday night, midway through the third quarter, were outgaining them 222 to 70. With 10 minutes to go in the third against Buffalo, Buffalo was outgaining them 315 to 90. Eventually, the luck box runs out. That's his exact wording. And yeah. I think that's a fascinating angle on this because as somebody on kind of the outside here, I see a team that won I, I or lost, I think, one game when they had a healthy quarterback last year and went to the Super Bowl and were a couple plays from winning the Super Bowl. And then they came back this year, another 10 and one. It's like the Eagles are just really good at winning, man. That's yeah, how I, I that's how I view it. Yeah, I I I am willing to accept the idea that they've gotten a little bit lucky, right? Like they've won four straight games despite getting outgained in all four of them. Yeah. Right. You watch the Kansas City game, if Travis Kelsey doesn't fumble there, um if they don't drop that long what would have been touchdown reception, I think it was on the final drive, the Chiefs win that game. Um Buffalo clearly had their chances, right? Two missed field goals and a chance to score the touchdown on the opening drive in overtime the miscommunication or bad throw, whatever it was between Josh Allen and Gabe Davis. You can certainly make the case that there's, there's a little bit of luck involved with the Eagles. And you see the comparisons made between this year's Eagles team, which is seven and one in one score games and last year's Minnesota Vikings team, which ended up being as fraudulent as we all thought they were right. in the playoffs given their absurd they, they they had some similar absurd they were one, 11 and 0 in one score games. 11 and 0 okay but the difference between the eagles and that vikings team is that this eagles team is just loaded like right. they have tons and tons of talent so you can make the case that they've gotten lucky um and that they probably aren't a 10 and 1 team uh, you know, they're probably more realistically an eight and three or seven and four team. Mm -hmm. Right. But I still think they're really good. And I still think this potentially poses the biggest test the 49ers face this year. Yeah. But I do think there's a pretty substantial difference in the level of urgency each team enters this week with this game, frankly, just means a whole lot more to the 49ers than it does the Eagles yeah. because the Eagles are in a stretch now five straight games um if you include washington they've beaten miami washington dallas kansas city and buffalo four really good teams and a kind of bad one in washington and if you looked mm -hmm. at that stretch earlier in the season you say man that's a gauntlet well the the mm -hmm. eagles are undefeated in that gauntlet and they beat yeah. buffalo in overtime with their defense playing 92 snaps coming off a short week you remember how how tired the 49ers looked a few weeks ago before their bye against Cincinnati mm -hmm. coming home after the short week in Minnesota. Um, I think there's, there's a chance that the Eagles are just like, you know, not that they're not going to play with intensity because obviously like it's, it's a big game, you know, like football players yeah. just get, get up for these games, right? That's just right. how they are, but they have a two game lead. If they had a one game lead going into this this weekend and the win gives the 49ers the one seed there's an entirely different feel for this game but because the eagles do have a little bit of breathing room a loss mm -hmm. for them doesn't really mean all that much they still are in the driver's seat for the one seed right so i i think like the niners the niner all the metrics say with all the metrics quote unquote not wins and losses say that the niners are the better team they're the more complete team which mm -hmm. I tend to agree with, but it's hard to scoff at the seven and one thing in one score games. When you look at how talented they are and how they win games on the margins right. and those, one of those margins being the tush push, like that's a, that's a substantial right. advantage, right? You basically, instead of playing on a hundred yard field, you're playing on like a 95 yard field when you know you can convert any fourth and one or third and one. Yeah. Yeah. And it, how many extra possessions do you get because of that? I mean, they, yeah. they probably they probably get three or four extra possessions again. I mean, I say extra possessions they're, where they're not giving the ball up. They extend possessions probably three or four times where they'd be punting or taking field goals. And that's I mean, just that's such a massive advantage. You think about only needing, in, instead of first and 10, 
you know, you're basically playing first and nine, right? That's a 10% yeah, right. advantage. Yeah, it's huge. <laughs> you know, it's just like, it's, 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 a, if you know, you can convert any short yardage play. It's, it's more or less a 10% advantage. And that's it. That's huge in the margins of all these games that are one score deficits ultimately. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Niners are one and two in one score games and they haven't played a whole lot of these one score games Their average margin of victory is over 20. You mm -hmm. know, when the Niners win, they blow teams out. Right. Um, the only one score win they've had was week two in LA against the Rams. And I will say the only that wasn't even a one score game. It was an eight. They won by eight. The Rams kicked a field goal. Oh, right, the last right, right. play of the game. You're right. They were you're down right. 10. You're right. You're right. You're right. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Actually, it was. Yeah, it was seven. But yeah, they kicked the. Yeah. I've, like literally, I've as time that. expired, their field goal went through to make Good it a one score game. Correct. Thanks. Correct. So yeah, that wasn't even a one score game. So technically, the Niners are 0 2 in one score games. The thing is, with those one score games, they either lost Trent Williams or didn't have Trent Williams right. in those games. Right. Yeah, Cleveland and Minnesota, and the Cleveland or, game they probably should have won. Had Jake Moody made one of his kicks, and the officiating not been awful either at the in the fourth quarter or at the end of the first half. Um, yeah. so I just hey. think like <laughs> our guy, our guy Hind, 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 our guy with an H in the chat, Jake <laughs> Elliott versus Jake Moody with a rain emoji. It's a substantial advantage for the Eags, I think. The Eags? Yeah. Yeah, I, I would the agree goals? with that. The goals? The, goals. the birds? The, move? the birds. Um, I, I, Yeah, and that's the other element of this. Remember when Brock Purdy was trying to throw in the rain in Cleveland and it just looked like, man, he could like barely grip he the football? He looked like a seventh-round pick. <laughs> Kyle Shanahan said today, which I thought was interesting, and I don't know if he was just saying this to like – be the guy instilling confidence in his quarterback. But he, in his press conference, said he's of all the quarterbacks he's coached, he's, he thinks Brock Purdy is as good, if not better, than any other quarterback that he's had playing in the rain. The bar's not high. I guess not. But also, like, you know, if you, you if he's not going to say, like, yeah, I don't, don't love it. <laughs> you know who is great? In the rain? A little Brian small. Hoyer. <laughs> Brian Hoyer is way better than Brock in the rain. No, Shan like Shanahan's never going to say anything like that because holding on to the ball is like a lot. It just has a lot to do with confidence, right? So yes, you know i i I'm taking that with a big old big old grain of salt. Um, Shot of tequila, sure, <laughs> or you know, pound of Cooperage, shotgun of Cooperage beer or something. There you go. Um, but. I don't know. I'm I'm off track on my point here, Sorry, but I, I, my fault. I think the rain is like, I think the Niners are the better team. Um, I think the Eagles have had the better season, if that makes sense, because they haven't had a three game losing streak. They did lose to the Jets um, and Zach Wilson, which is notable. But I think the Eagles are a team that's gotten lucky, but I think they're better than the typical team we think about that gets lucky because they are really good on the margins and they're super talented. Yeah, they don't. I feel like lucky to me, and maybe I maybe I'm missing something with the Eagles here, but with Minnesota last year, remember their win in Buffalo, yeah. where Josh Allen like fumbled doing a QB sneak at the one, and then Justin Jefferson had that ridiculous catch. There was just, it, there were all these wild ass things that happened in that game. That's like that's atypical of a football game. That's why that's in the the Vikings did not deserve to win that game. It felt like that happened multiple times with the Vikings. And we talked we had our guy Matt Collar on, who who covers the Vikings and has a has a podcast on Blue Wire, and he mentioned a lot of their one score games were like that one that that the Niners and Rams played this year where a team maybe scored late and made it a one score game, but really it was kind of in hand for the Vikings. But with Minnesota, you could tell like, Hey man, this 13 and four, when you want, this does not look like a 13 and four team. Whereas with the Eagles, like, man, their kicker is good. And he hit a 59 yard field goal in the rain. And man, Jalen hurts is really good. And 
he is capable of making plays on the ground and he's making big throws and AJ Brown is is one of the three best receivers in the league right now and he's making big catches down the field to set up a touchdown and their defense is making enough plays to hold the Chiefs to 17 points and you just start to look at all these things and it's it's just a confluence of okay maybe not everything is perfect but they have a lot of super talented players and when you need a stop you're looking at Jalen Carter and Jordan Davis and Hassan Reddick and Darius Slay and James Bradbury and you're going man that's a that's a defense that can go get a stop and on offense, it's Jalen Hurts and DeAndre Swift and A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith and uh, the best offensive line in the league. And you're going, man, that's an offense that's going to go score. And it may not be perfect for an entire game, but they scratch and claw and they're good enough to keep it close. And at the end of the game, on either side of the ball, they are good enough to do whatever they need to do, whether it's get a stop or go get points. And they're, despite the metrics and despite, you know, maybe some luck here and there, I I I think Philly is a legitimate, really good team and one of like five teams that can win the Super Bowl. Yeah, totally and agree. I, 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 the 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 funny thing is, is I self reflect here and I say all that is if the roles were flipped, like like if if the 49ers were ten and one and won all the all their games the way the Eagles have, and the Eagles were eight and three, and had the exact same path the Niners have had. I'd probably be sitting here going like, dude, look how dominant the Eagles have been. Like, yeah, they had that weird stretch, but look how good they've been the rest of the year. I'm going to take the nine weeks over the three. That's 100% how I'd be viewing this. <laughs> the Niners are, it's a little tough to figure out because like, not not necessarily tough to figure out, but like all of their wins basically have come with the same script. And we've mentioned this before, but they just like blow teams out. And mm-hmm. it's it's not a knock on them to say that um, you know, you wonder if they can win a different style of game than just like getting up and then throttling the other team they play. Like, I think one thing I would be really interested to see is just how the game script goes this week. Mm-hmm. Can they win a back and forth game? Can they win a game where they're down by five points with eight minutes left in the fourth quarter? Yeah. Right. Can they, because it, it's just felt like, They get ahead. They score at the end of the half to go up by 10 points. You know, they'll do the thing where they try to where they try to double up and uh, score before the half. And then they get the kickoff to open Mm -hmm. the third quarter and then they extend the lead and then it allows the defense to pin their ears back. Like, can the Niners win a game coming from behind? And, And one of the reasons why I have that question. Is the offensive line and. The Niners pass blocking offensive line legitimately might be the worst it's been under Kyle Shanahan. It's like Mm -hmm. you look at, at, at the numbers and and some of the advanced metrics, like it's definitely in the bottom third, maybe the bottom quarter of the league in terms of pure pass protection numbers, like pass rush, pass blocking win rate. And, Mm -hmm. you know, like, and all of the, and pressures allowed and things like that. And one of the reasons why the 49ers are able to survive is because they're playing from ahead. They're running the ball a lot. They're utilizing play action. They're moving the pocket, which allows them to negate pressure from other teams, despite not having a talented offensive line in terms of pass blockers outside of Trent Williams. Mm -hmm. If you're behind, then that, then that completely changes sort of the playbook that, that you can, that you can, go into right like you can't team if if it's if you're down by 14 points play action is just not going to work nearly the same teams are going to be like yeah go ahead run the ball we don't care right we're going to drop eight guys into coverage you want to run the ball fine so do do does the 49ers offense lose some of its efficiency if it's playing from behind and has to pass pass the ball and does that open up the 49ers offensive line to allowing more sacks against a really talented Eagles pass rush? Mm-hmm. Right. Like we know the thing is the, the thing that stands out to me about the Eagles and that seven and one record in one score games is we know they can win games that have different looks. They can win different types of games. They can blow teams out. They mm-hmm. can win shootouts. They can win defensive struggles. Like, We've seen the 49ers be really dominant for most of the season. 
But yeah. all of those wins feel like they just jump ahead and stay ahead. Yeah. And again, that's not a knock on them. It's just like we haven't really seen them be in a position where they have to win a shootout or win a back and forth game. And the only times that that's happened is when they haven't had Trent Williams. Right. We got, we haven't gotten to see this iteration of the 49ers playing a game like that. Yeah. Now that's not to say if they go into Philadelphia and, (laughs) and win 28 to 13 and just kind of cruise that it's bad. In fact, I think that would be the ideal outcome for them. But I, I get a hundred percent what you're saying when it gets down to crunch time. Like I honestly, I, I, here's something I wanted to bring up. So I'll, I'll bring it up here. I don't think the atmosphere is going to bother them. No, like it did they've not been in all, like, they've been in plenty of big games. Right. And it, it did not feel like in the NFC title game last year. And again, it was a small sample, but that first drive defensively, it's not like they were shook. They got off the field. Kyle Shanahan just didn't challenge it. And they were going to get off the field before that, if not for an incredible catch by A.J. Brown on on a third down play by uh, Jalen Hurts. Remember the one where he's backpedaling? I think Warner was blitzing. And he just kind of lobbed it into the middle of the field, and A.J. Brown caught it like it is shoe tops. And that moves the chains. And, and the Niners' offense was cruising when Purdy got hurt. So... I don't think the moment is going to be too big for them. That's not a a concern I necessarily have. And I think that's where the whole, okay, it's the Niners score, or or I'm sorry, the Eagles score with a minute 54 left. And the Niners have one timeout and they're down two. Can Brock Purdy in the offense drive down and score in that spot? And, and preferably can, score where you're not giving the Eagles any time to get the ball back. And do you trust Jake Moody to make that kick? And do you trust Jake Moody to make the kick? <laughs> Inside of 40, absolutely. 40 or 41, <laughs> no dice. No, I don't know. but I mean, <laughs> go ahead. Jo- jokes aside, that is that is a spot where the Eagles defense has been in that situation a bunch of times this year. And the 49ers offense hasn't. So that that is a question that I have. But again, it's not I'm with you. It's not saying, oh, they can't do this or this is something I've seen that they they haven't been able to do yet. It's just like the opportunity hasn't been there. Right. Like they're literally zero for zero with their healthy offense in a tight game. Yeah. And and so I think for me, it's just kind of like a bigger picture conversation than just this week against the Eagles, because. What's happened in, you know, their biggest playoff games when they've lost? It's mm-hmm. that they've fallen behind in fourth quarters and then been unable to come back in large part because, you know, Chris Jones is is dominating the, the interior of the offensive line or Aaron Donald's dominating the interior of the offensive line. Mm-hmm. Right. Like that's and, you know, I, I don't think the 49ers are built to win one way. That's not what I'm saying. Sure. I'm just saying we don't have any evidence to prove they can win big games in a multitude of ways, which mm-hmm. is what I think the Eagles have an advantage. They just have a library of games that they can think about and say, yeah, we we won in this adverse situation. We won mm-hmm. in that adverse situation. And the Niners are just kind of steamrolling teams. And maybe Sunday is a test case for them where it's sure. like, okay, you know, we were down, we were down 28, 24 with four minutes left. And we had to go put together a game winning drive on the road to, you know, like Mm -hmm. with a lot on the line in terms of the one seed. And, and that would be a really valuable thing come playoff time. Yeah. But if it was a situation like that, and then it ends up being, you know, a sack or a Brock Purdy interception and the 49ers lose while trying to come from behind, then I think you could make a legitimate case that it's a chink in their armor, particularly given what we've seen from them in the Super Bowl against the Chiefs and in the NFC Championship game against the Rams. I'm throwing out last year's NFC title game because of all the injury stuff to the quarterbacks. But I want to talk about last year's NFC title game when we're done here. Yeah, well, I mean, we can bring that up too. Even though the 49ers did lose Brock Purdy, I remember in the second quarter of that game, the Niners' defense was kind of kicking Philly's ass for a minute there. Bro, Philly went, I mentioned that first drive. 
Philly goes, and let me preface this, and I'll say this a couple times, because Philly fans are are nuts and will find anything. Philadelphia won the game. <laughs> Fair and square. <laughs> they were the better team. I'm not even convinced that a healthy Brock Purdy would have won that game. Okay? I, I think a healthy Brock Purdy could have won the game. Uh, t- totally. But I, Philly was a very good team that should have won the Super Bowl. And, okay, they were awesome. And they won the game fair and square. Okay. That said, the 31-7 final score is very misleading. They had the touchdown on the first drive. They go 11 plays, 66 yards. But again, Shanahan doesn't challenge the Devontae Smith catch. And good on the okay, good on the Eagles for lining up and running a play. Um, and not giving the Niners a chance to look at it. And that that really incredible third down play that I that I mentioned earlier with Jalen Hurts and, and AJ Brown on the short throw. Okay. So they had that touchdown drive. Then they go three plays, six yards punt, four plays, eleven yards punt, three plays, negative four yards punt. Then they go 14 plays, 75 yards, and a touchdown to make it 14-7 with less than two minutes to go. And then Josh Johnson couldn't catch a shotgun snap. Eagles recover. They go down and score right before the half. They make it 21-7, and that's when the wheels came off. But even in the second half, they go, they punted on their first drive. And then, I mean, at that point, the, the wheels really came off for the Niners defense. And Philly scores a touchdown at the end of the third quarter. And then they kick a field goal in the fourth, and that was it. But to your to what you were saying, if Josh Johnson just catches a shotgun snap, and even if the Niners don't score, it's fourteen to seven at the half. That's, I mean, that's notable to me. Yeah, I mean, look, Philadelphia can... won the game, fair and square. Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I I just. I wonder, like, to me, it, this feels more like a mental edge game. Like the, like the, the result will have a more tangible effect, intangible effect than a tangible effect. Hmm. Like the Niners win, they'll still have to get kind of lucky in the form of the Eagles dropping a, another game they shouldn't, while the Niners win out to get the one seed. Right? Like the right. Niners essentially can't get the one seed without winning this game. Um, but I find like the value of this game more about intangibles, like. Okay, if the Niners go and blow out the Eagles on their home field and then they end up meeting again in the playoffs, like the Niners are going to feel great about going to Philadelphia in January if that's the case, right? Mm-hmm. Like if they just go in and and win by 13 points at at the top team in the NFC's home field, then then you get a mental edge whereas there's no, you know, the Niners can't have a mental edge over the Eagles right now. If anything, thinking about the Eagles brings them just like pain, given how high the expectations were going into that NFC title game last year. Mm-hmm. But if you go in and win in December and then you play them again in a month, you're feeling pretty good, or I guess two months, you're feeling pretty good about where you're at from a mentality standpoint. Whereas if you go in and lose and the game looks like the Cleveland game, I'm not saying the Niners couldn't win there if they got back there in the playoffs, Mm -hmm. but you feel dramatically different going into that game. Do you not? Yes. Extremely. Like 180 degrees different. Yeah. Because now it's this, oh, this isn't equal. And now it's just a business trip and mano a mano, which team is better. And it's not this giant that needs to be slayed. I, I couldn't agree more with you. Yeah, so I, I think it's a big game just from like, okay, we can beat these dudes. And like, not not that, you know, I think the 49ers very much believe that they can beat this team even before they play Sunday, right? Like, they're just really, really good and they should have all the confidence in the world. But yeah. it's different to go in to, to go in and actually do it rather than like, it can. Mm-hmm. it's a different feeling to actually go do something than to believe you can do it beforehand. Right, they've talked a lot of shit. <laughs> it's there's yeah. uh they 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 have to they have to go play well yeah because and it would no be... i if they if they go in and keep in mind i don't think this is going to happen but if they go lose by like a lot if they go lose by two touchdowns and it's just not close like that could derail the rest of the year 
that could be given how much they've talked after the NFC title game and given what Philly represents and the fact that it's Niners Eagles one, two in the, in the NFC, not necessarily in that order to go, to go lose by a lot, I think would be a, a really, really tough pill to swallow where all of a sudden you have a team that's looking inwardly like, well, I guess it's just kind of the, the ceiling. And then you look around the locker room, how loaded the roster is. And it's like, what's the point? <laughs> you know? So I feel like, like the Niners are so talented and like a generally a good team that if they lost via like in a blowout, I feel like some weird shit would have to happen. Like it would feel fluky as hell, right? Like you lose, you lose Trent Williams in the first quarter. And then, you know, like a Brock Purdy fumble sack fumble leads to a Eagles touchdown. They go up by two scores in the first quarter and then it's just downhill from there. And it's all kind of like, all right, just turns into a bad yeah. scenario, which can happen. Um, I think what would be worse for the Niners mentally would be losing a close game. Oh, interesting. Because like have all your guys healthy and just have the Eagles just like make more plays in crunch time and just, I, hmm. and just be the better team in the, in the moments, because that, that to me would be like the Cincinnati game, right? Like it, it in hindsight, it felt really bad. Like the chiefs game, um, last year when they got completely destroyed in Christian McCaffrey's yeah. first game, those felt really bad in the moment. But you look back, you're just like, ah, eh, some weird stuff happened. Like you, sometimes yeah. games just get away from you and like they're blowouts and it's not really indicative of how good you are. But if the Niners have their fastball and then lose, to me, that that would be more damaging from a, from a mental standpoint than just like, ah, whatever, the game got away from us. Like, if if you know we don't lose so and so to injury and we don't turn the ball over here, it's it's a different game. But if they play really well and lose, I think that's more mentally damaging. Man, see, I I think I disagree. To me, if you play really well and lose, you can go back and go, man, one or two plays go our way. We're on the same level as that team. Da da da. da. If you go in there in the biggest game of the year a game you've had circled since the schedule came out and a team you've had circled since January of last year. And you go in and lay an egg where you lose 31 to 10. That to me would be, it would be really hard to go. Yeah, I just didn't have it today. Like, no, it's not acceptable. You can't just not have it in, in the right. game that you've been looking ahead to in a game where you had additional days of rest in a game where you had all your dudes. Like I don't, I don't think that there's a world where you can just brush that off. It's like, meh, meh. Yeah, yeah, I'm we'll, just saying. We'll see them again in January. I don't. Mm. I think if they were to lose 31-10, I think it would have to be some weird, like some weird turnover stuff, some weird like injury stuff, like some correctable things. You know, like that's what I'm saying. Like if they if they have all their guys and just play really bad and weird stuff doesn't happen and they just get blown out, then yeah, that's obviously really damaging. Mm -hmm. But I, I think the only way the Niners really lose blow, a blowout game on Sunday with like the rest advantage that they have and with the health situation that they have, you know, knock on wood, they're like a healthy team going into this mm -hmm. for them to lose 31 10. I think a lot of weird stuff would have to happen. That's all I'm saying. So like weird stuff happening in a loss, you know, they, they would come out of it being like, OK, you, we, we still think we can beat them if like we just can somehow avoid the weird stuff from happening. But if I just don't see, I think the 49ers are too good for, for them to get blown out without anything, just completely like without losing Trent Williams or losing Fred Warner to injury or, you know, whatever, something like that. Yeah, no, I sure. Um, you know, but weird turnover stuff and a blown coverage here and a kick return for a touchdown there. And which we haven't talked about, but the Niners look ripe for giving up a kick return touchdown. Bro, they're trying so hard. Hey, <laughs> shut up. Hey, you know who we didn't talk about in the post game pod? Darrell Luter, whose first NFL tackle was a touchdown saver on a kick return. Shout out to the to the fifth round pick from South Alabama. I don't I don't have the numbers, but the 49ers feel like they lead the NFL in almost giving up a kickoff touchdown. 
<laughs> I don't I don't watch enough other games and keep track of stuff like that to know this for sure. This is a very official stat. It feels like once a game. Once or there's, twice. If it if yeah, there's a like ah! <laughs> like oh oh man boy he had a crease. The pun and coverage now, is... and now and now remove your best special teams player in George Odom. Cool. The pun the pun coverage feels great because Mitch Wishnowski is is leading the league and pinning teams inside the ten and Swish he's Wishnowski might be the most underrated player in the NFL. Full stop. Dude, this but is the kickoff coverage does not seem great. They they just need they just need Jake Moody to kick it out of the end zone every time. That yeah, th thank oh, you. That, shout out to Terrence. Terrence. Terrence Strong in the point. YouTube chat agrees with you. Uh, he said they need to kick touchbacks for the rest of the season. Moody said he can do it, but the coaches want to dare teams to return. Well, then they need to stop daring teams to return. Launch it into the 10th row. Yeah. I don't understand. I don't, I don't understand it. If the Niners were like a rock solid coverage unit where, man, you know what? It's actually worth it to, to do that high kick that, that drops on the five and force the guy to return it because maybe you get maybe you get a fumble, you know, maybe maybe you wind up tackling him in the inside the ten and it's field position, da da da. No, 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 no. That's what that's what Mitch Twishnowski's for. Get the kickoff coverage team, make them irrelevant, launch the kick out of the end zone. Every time. Coaching malpractice if they don't do that, and someone will need to be held accountable. My pick is Kyle Shanahan. <laughs> <laughs> um kickoff return yardage yards per return oh man oh, yeah. this is all this is Hell this yeah. is terrible pre pre-pod planning by me you you google nfl return like return um, oh yeah no that's that's, that's dude pro football reference seasons and scroll down come on this your first okay. podcast fair enough it's your first Basically. time doing this <laughs> well, so I'm finding like individual returners stats, not kick coverage stats. Oh, you want? Oh, I see. Okay. I want the Niners kick coverage stats. Oh my God. They probably don't keep track of those because no one ever needs them. Well, that would I mean, be my We guess. clearly do. <laughs> anyway, unofficially, the Niners lead the NFL in almost allowing touchdowns every single game on kickoffs. <laughs> <laughs> That's a. a Candlestick Chronicle, no stick, no wickles, advanced metric mm -hmm. of the week. <laughs> but no, the I mean, the 49ers are 23rd in average kickoff yards. Don't know what that means. Average kickoff touchback yards? percentage. Here we go. They are 30th in touchback percentage. Yeah. That what about to be at yards least per kickoff 20th. return allowed? I don't have it. I don't have a dog. No, I I where's, where's Josh Dubow when you need him? Bro, seriously. He's probably at the big house still, just partying his ass off. <laughs> I saw he him. Hasn't last been, night. He hasn't he hasn't been home in four days. He's still drunk. He had very little to say about my Michigan rant uh from last week. Or he, he hasn't worn a shirt. Sunday's Sunday's pod. He has Jim Harbaugh's face tattooed on his ass now. Doesn't know when he got that. <laughs> kicking kicking punt returns says hashtag free harbaugh across his lower back as well he got that last week he remembers it fully america's team on his bicep <laughs> just below the barbed wire that's been there since 2006 kicking yeah. i don't kickoffs. i don't i don't care enough about this to help you research it the 49ers giving up a kickoff return or a punt return for a touchdown is definitely a thing that needs to be on the table because boy, they were awfully close twice last week, by the way, mind you, mm -hmm. the Seahawks also had a big return late in the game. So kickoffs. the Washington yeah. commanders, by the way, 96.3% touchback rate. It can be done. I can find kickoff yardage, like for some, like the the length of each kickoff from the right. kicker's foot, but I can't find the return yards. Anyway, we'll Sorry, we'll man. fully research this and come back. Hey, stay tuned pod. for stay tuned for tomorrow's pod. 
um, do you think do you think Sunday's game will have bearing on the MVP race? Yes. If Brock Purdy throws for three bills and four touchdowns, and the Niners win, and Jalen Hurts goes uh, nineteen of thirty for two hundred yards and a touchdown and two picks, then yeah, one hundred percent. But yeah, also, so I think Dak Prescott is just going to win the MVP. So, Dak Prescott? Yeah, bro. Dak is slanging the pill right now. He is. Go look. I, just... D- Doug Farrar, who I do a who I do a video with every week uh, for USA Today Sports Media Group called Four Down Territory. Check it out. Um, he brought up Dak, and I was like, okay, like classic football guy, just picking his. To, but then you go look at the numbers and it's like, oh, oh yeah, and Dallas is good still. Like Dallas wins a lot of games. I wouldn't pick him in the playoffs, but Dak is playing his ass off. So since the Niners game, they the 49ers beaten... are 25th in overall special teams grade, by the way. That tracks. And Wishnowski's carrying carrying all the water in that. Oh, big time. Um, the Cowboys since losing to the 49ers by 32 points. Uh, they've beaten the Chargers, had their bye week, beaten the Rams, lost to the Eagles, whooped up on the Giants, whooped up on the Panthers, and whooped up on the Durs of Washington. Mm. I understand Dak Prescott is playing well, but like, I would like to see it come against a little bit better competition before I'm handing him the MVP. Not to say that he's not in the conversation. Yeah. But... I don't know. Is the MVP Jalen Hurts right now? I don't. Sure. I, I don't I feel like it, it should just... be Tyree kill, but I feel like Jalen Hurts would get the that vote. was my. OK, so it's funny you say that in that same video I was just talking about with Doug Farrar from from the NFL wire sites. Uh, I picked Tyree kill. If Tyree kill goes for twenty one hundred yards and twenty touchdowns. Like, what are we doing? Picking a quarterback. Right. Like, at that point, it's just picking a quarterback to pick one. And I get the Jalen Hurts argument, right? He has 11 rushing touchdowns, and only two of those has been from outside of three yards. But he's on ostensibly national TV against the Bills, running in a game-winning score, and he's making a big throw against the Chiefs late uh, to to set up the game-winning touchdown. And he's doing all this stuff, and four game-winning comeback drives, and that's just kind of the the ethos of the Eagles this year is they're 10 and one and look at their badass quarterback leading them to victories. Like he's just got the the narrative on his side. So he wouldn't, I wouldn't vote for him, but I get why he's the favorite. If that makes sense. I think he's accounted for 29 touchdowns <laughs> between passing and, and receiving and Brock Purdy's accounted for 22 just for context. That's um, so many. It's a lot of touchdowns. I, I think I definitely think Brock Purdy, he's sort of like on the fringes of the conversation right now. I think he could fully insert himself into the conversation, particularly like if he does what we were talking about earlier, like when come from behind. Brock Purdy doesn't have a game winning drive. Um, yeah. This and we need to have a huge and Jaylen, game. And Jalen Hurts has four. Yeah. But again, part of that is because Brock Purdy has been like really good and they haven't had they haven't needed a game winning drive with the exception of yeah. Cleveland. Yeah. Um, so I, I definitely think the narrative could shift. If Christian McCaffrey has a huge game, I think he might re-enter the MVP discussion. Is that fair? Yeah, maybe if he has a couple touchdowns for sure. Yeah, I think with Purdy, he needs to have a big game. And yeah, have maybe like a game winning drive or like the Niners win 31 to 17 and pretty balls out and is just four touchdowns and hurt struggles. And everybody goes, oh, wow, look at the look at Brock Purdy and the Niners. You want to know what's wild? What? Jalen Hurts and Christian McCaffrey both have 11 rushing touchdowns. (laughs) (laughs) That's incredible. That's pretty crazy. CMC looking up receiving touchdowns. He's still the the rushing leader, um, but he has five. 
Yeah, so 16 total touchdowns through 11 games. Pretty decent. I don't know. We'll see. I think a big CMC game could could catapult him into that convo. I think CMC, it could be one of those where like, I mean, if Tyreek wins MVP, he probably wouldn't also win Offensive Player of the Year. So it could be like, I think I think the move this year is to not have a quarterback win MVP. I would agree with you. I don't think that's going to happen. I think it would be Jalen Hurts or, but if not, it, I mean, we'll see. There's a lot of time left. Um, but I, I would, I think like as of right now, I would probably go Tyreek MVP, Christian McCaffrey, Offensive Player of the Year. Yeah. Because really like what should happen is Tyreek wins MVP and Offensive Player of the Year. Mm-hmm. But because there are two awards, like, I mean, I don't, why do we have two awards? <laughs> you know, like, we because, should just have like a quarter. Because MVP has jumped the shark. Yeah. I, the the way the league has shifted and gone where it's so not only offense driven, but passing driven and quarterback driven where the best quarterback is just that's the best team and the best roster. It is the quarterback above all else. So it's the quarterback's award. And then the offensive player of the year is the consolation. Like, oh, hey, you were good, too. You know what I like about the Heisman is it's not it doesn't try to assign value. Right. It's not about the most valuable player. It's just like the best player in college football. wins. Right. Who is the best goddamn guy? That's yeah. I think there should be like a quarterback award and like whatever the equivalent of the Heisman award is. Mm hmm. And then like a a best skill position player award for either the best receiver and or running back. Right. I think that would be the best way to do it. MVP is like, yeah, obviously it has to go to a quarterback. Yeah, right. As by by definition, like there's been so much analytical work. Yeah, there's been so much analytical work done to prove how valuable quarterbacks are. Um, Flynn West brings up a great point in the YouTube chat. He says Jalen Hurts turns the ball over just as much as the next guy and is playing behind the best O-line in the league. He is not MVP. That's one of the things I think is interesting about quarterback discourse is Brock Purdy, everything he does gets the caveat of, yeah, but, I mean, the offensive line and the weapons. I mean, coaching. Ugh. There's no way. He's, uh, just look at his uh, the weapons and uh, Trent Williams. And, uh. Like, the Eagles suck? <laughs> like, wh- they have the best offensive line in the league. AJ Brown and Devontae Smith have an argument to be the best receiving duo in football. DeAndre Swift is a, an excellent player. It's not like the Eagles are a bunch of trash <laughs> and Jalen Hurts is dragging these dudes to, to wins. Like, nah, they're they're pretty good, man. I think we're just obsessed with like what guys look like in uniforms and how strong their arms are. Well, and, and how and, big they are and yeah. combine numbers. Right. If Brock Purdy was 6'6 and had a rocket arm, he would be the talk of the league. But because he's six foot one and doesn't have a really strong arm, he has to like win a Super Bowl to prove his value to people. If the 49ers had traded up, let's say in the third round, uh, you know what? We'll go earlier. Second round. And drafted Brock Purdy in the second round. It would have been like, what an overdraft. Oh my God, everybody freaks the hell out. And then he comes in and cooks and it would be Kyle Shanahan's a goddamn genius. Look at how awesome this quarterback is. How did nobody see this? He's amazing. I don't want to get into the Brock Purdy discourse, but I just have a theory. Like people are more inclined to like a player or think a player's good. If he's big and buff and looks sick in the uniform, bro, that's my draft analysis. That's 80% of it. (laughs) It's like, hey, you know what? That guy's cleats look dumb. I'm out. Like, like it's, that it's... guy wears a shooting sleeve? Count me in. The <laughs> visor? Yeah. You wear a dark visor, you're flying up my draft board. Every time. You got long hair banging out the back of your helmet? You're round one grade. Count it. Andrew Van Ginkle, stand up. Dude, the gink. <laughs> Um, no, I just, I, I think there's a bias. I don't know if it's like created by Madden because everyone loves to create players in Madden Mm -hmm. or if it's just like draft culture and like, oh, that guy looks like he's sick on 
YouTube highlights or whatever. But I, honestly, is? like, that... I think if Brock Purdy was like this big hulking dude and not this like, you know, less than average sized quarterback, I think people would view him differently. <laughs> if Brock Purdy was this big hulking dude and not this bitch. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's not what I said. <laughs> no, I, I, I agree with you. And I think it's because being like, wow, that guy looks awesome. Ergo, I'm going to just make up in my head what he's supposed to look like like on the field and how he's supposed to play, that's way easier than acquiring like all 22 and grinding all 22 and learning what to watch for. The, the, scouting requires so much work. And I think it's easier to be like, yeah, that guy looks sick as hell. And other people like him as a late first rounder. Well, I'm going to make him a mid to early first rounder because damn, he should be awesome based on how he looks. I've read so many scouting reports that start with looks good on the hoof, which basically means like, yep, that looks the nuts. part. <laughs> Here's the looks first thing you need to know. Nuts. Here's the first thing you need to know. If you're, if you're getting off the bus, you, you want this guy towards the front. <laughs> I want my worst player, my worst looking player getting off the bus first. I want Brock Purdy getting off the bus first. <laughs> Your wor your worst looking player and you go with Brock Purdy. Lull that lull that team. Not into the a Australian false security. Not the Australian punter with the bad mustache and mullet. No, no because <laughs> Wish is an absolute unit. <laughs> it's like, damn, that guy's gonna rush the passer. Dang. And you find out he's a punter. Anyways. No, it's, um, the answer is the yeah, answer is Jake thing. Moody. If you're going worst guy off the bus. I mean Yeah. Yeah. Um I was going to make a joke, but I'm going to hold off because somebody said I was too hard on Jake Moody and they made a great point. They said, I love the pod, but dude, your Moody analysis is insane and cringeworthy and this and that. And I'm like, you know what? You're probably right. I'm probably too hard on the kid. So I'm going to not make a joke. The only the only Jake Moody take I will have is you draft him in the third round. You need him to be one of the better kickers in the league. And he has not been to this point. Not from outside 40 yards. He hasn't been. Somebody said Moody's actually been good. He's hit 82.4% of his field goals. Like, brother, that is not a good number. That is do not use that stat when trying to say how good Jake Moody is. Uh, no, but I am going to uh, withhold uh, comment on, on Jake Moody here. Uh, last thing for me before we get out of here. Uh, do you have any more Niner stuff before tomorrow's pod? Uh, the Browns game happened regarding Jake Moody. That's that's the only point I will make. Totally. But that was a super deep field goal. It was like 41 yards. You can't expect him to make that. Anymore. <laughs> so <laughs> Now, um, a couple of people have, have tagged us on Instagram and stuff with their like Spotify wrapped showing that mm. they listen to our podcast a shitload. Uh, Cheese Smith, shout out to the homie Cheese uh hopping in to our youtube chat he said he's a top six percent fan on spotify the pod um that is hella appreciated um and just the fact that people fuck with us like that and listen to our podcast and uh check in on youtube and on twitter and instagram and stuff is super damn cool and uh it is never any less appreciated so if we do happen to pop up in your spotify wrapped or whatever app you use to listen to us uh go ahead and tag us and i will repost it because it's uh, really cool that people do that so shout out to all of you uh you are appreciated yeah the youtube numbers have been growing steadily the uh the x formerly twitter numbers have been growing steadily the the actual podcast numbers have always been super solid yeah um and growing year over year and uh yeah man those the support's awesome whether it's just online or coming to the live events at Cooperage every August or September, whenever they happen to be. Yeah. Um, the support for the pod has always been amazing. I wasn't, I was in new Orleans covering the Kings and a random man. I've, I wish I had gotten this guy's name. I think he was a cameraman working for the NBA in new Orleans was, uh, was like, wait, you have that Niners podcast. <laughs> like, I was like, yeah, man, that's me. Totally. <laughs> and he was like, and then he goes, uh, he goes, man, I hope, I hope Cooperage and Lamb Chops really pay you. And I was like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they paid it's for fun. my travel to New Orleans. No. <laughs> no, they did not. What if but, he was uh, like, hey, you have no. that Niners podcast, right? 49ers talk, you're Matt Mayoko, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that only happens That only happens in Mike Silver in the, in the elevator at Levi's. 
um, but yeah, we appreciate yeah. we appreciate the support. Uh, we know people listen from well outside the Bay Area in California, so it's awesome. Yeah. So thanks. Also, one last one last thing on this. Several people have reached out this year with like, I, I criticism sounds harsh, but like critiques and mm-hmm. thoughts on ways to make the pod better or, uh, you know, clarification of something we said and have been super chill about it. And that's also great because man, I work in radio and people are not always chill when they disagree with something you say. Um, <laughs> so it's really nice to, to have a discourse and, and talk with, with people who, who love football and love the 49ers. It's, it's uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not at all on board with the, the personal attacks because someone disagrees with the sports take that, that is it's just wild to me nuts. that that happens. Yeah. That's just a, that you get a mute and, and get out of here. But when somebody's like, Hey, yeah. love the pod. But like the J the I wish I could again wish I could remember who it was. Um, he didn't have his real name on his. It was like his Twitter handle, and he was like, "I love the pod, but your Jake Moody shit is out of control." And I was like, "You know what, man? I think you're probably right. I go way too hard on him. Like it's it's, it's kind of a bit that lean too far into. I will adjust accordingly." Yeah, yeah, we got to do this. I'm, I'm we got to do the, the dude rankings. We got to do the dude rankings. Okay. All right, everybody. That's going to do it for us. We will have another pod for you. We, we're recording this Wednesday. We'll record another one Thursday with a deeper dive on the on the Eagles and 49ers matchup. And we will have our, our uh, prize picks, of course. We will have our Cooperage What's on Tap for you. And uh, really can't wait. This is the most excited I've been for a regular season game in a, in a long time. So um, appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. And we will talk to you. Uh, Subscribe, rate, review, do all that uh, on YouTube. Make sure to subscribe, like the video, and uh, we'll talk to you guys next time. See you guys.